Anchored in Reaching is for curious people who want to explore the story that God is writing in history and who are looking for their own place in that story to find meaning and vibrancy in their life and vocation. I'm Kevin Manoya. Join me each week as Susanna Fleming and I probe the edges of faith and living, always in relation to God who knows you best. For some, it'll be an opportunity to anchor yourself more securely in your faith. For others, it'll be motivation to reach out to engage more broadly. In either case, these conversations should encourage, enlighten, and challenge you. Hey everyone, Susanna here. Welcome to Anchored and Reaching. And I'm here with the one, the only, Dr. (laughs) Kevin Minoya. Yeah, hey everybody. And I'm here with the one, the only, Susanna Fleming. That's true. That's not a very common name, I don't think, so... (laughs) Well, you think Kevin Manoya is a common name? That's a good point. That's a good point. It's great to be with everybody, that's for sure. It is really great to be with you guys. We're trying out a new format this round of episodes, and we want to see how you like it. Kevin will be teaching for a little bit at the beginning of this, and then we're going to have a conversation. Really, our goal here is to equip you with opportunities to think deeply and think well about things. And so if this format is working for you, if you like it, please send us an email. Let us know. Um, We're not just doing this to get emails. Like We genuinely want you to be participants in this. And so you can send um, the email to podcast at anchoredandreaching.com and just give us feedback on the format. Um, If you have any questions too, we'd love to answer them. So with that, Kevin is going to talk to us today about salvation. And you will hear in a little bit that um, salvation is a much bigger topic than you maybe recognized. And I actually recommend, if you can, taking some notes on your phone if you're out on a walk, if you're doing things, because he's going to lay some things out for you that are really important to chew on. So yeah, without further ado, Kevin, take it away. What a privilege to be able to talk a little bit about one of the greatest gifts that God has ever given to anyone, uh, and we get to be the recipients of this gift that we call salvation. And I want to talk to us a little bit about this, and as we, as Susanna and I will get into more discussion about this, but um, what really is salvation? And I'd like to suggest to you that salvation is a whole lot more than getting saved. Now, I know that that's a phrase that we hear all the time in church, and we talk about it. When did you get saved? Did they get saved? Let's get them saved. Whatever it is that we talk about, it all points back to this idea of salvation as the core of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And often we reduce it to a minimalistic understanding of a transactional agreement that we have with God, where whereby we're going to somehow do whatever it takes to get a ticket to heaven so that we can boycott hell. And salvation becomes nothing more than that, when in reality, it is the fullest element of God's engagement with us. It is the gift that changes us, and it is not merely a point in time when we sign on the dotted line so that if we die in our bodily form, we're going to somehow go to heaven. Salvation is this amazing gift of God that keeps moving and shaping and dynamically changing our lives from moment to moment until we are with Christ, we are with God in eternity. So let's talk a little bit about what this salvation story is and why it's so important for us to zoom out and get a good view of salvation as more than a transactional contract that if we do X, then God will do Y. If we kneel and say the sinner's prayer, then somehow we are going to go to heaven when we die. Now, that's a very important part of salvation, but it's not the whole story. See, the story of salvation and the journey of salvation is more than getting saved so that when we die, we don't go to hell. Salvation really means the restoring or the restoration of the image of God in us. Now, when we start with that as a premise, all of a sudden everything changes. Salvation is the restoration of the image of God in us. See, when God first created us in Genesis 1, it was like God created a mirror image of God's own self. 
Uh, God, you know, on, on day six, created humankind, male and female. And he looked at humankind and he said, it is very good. Not just good, but it is very good. And at some point, we're going to talk about God's expressions to us in multiple forms, the chief one of which is the creation of humankind. So it's as if God created this mirror, and the mirror was in close proximity with God. Remember in Genesis it says that Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the evening with God. There was close proximity. So when you put a mirror in close proximity to the object it's designed to reflect, it's going to reflect that object perfectly. It's going to be clear, there's going to be no question about it, and there's going, to, there's going to be a clear reflection of the image of the original. Just like when God looked at humankind as if he was looking in a mirror and said, it's very good. But part of that creation of humankind was giving us uh, a feature that we today call free will. That is, we get to choose things. We make our own decisions. God does not overpower us by forcing his will on us. We have choice. We have free will. And we have a sense of autonomy. Well, when you combine free will and autonomy, the result was selfish choices. In other words, autonomy asserts itself, activates free will, and then you have a selfish choice. My own sense of self says, I want it my way, and I have the ability to do it my way in my free will, so I choose to do it my way. So God comes along and he says, hey, I don't want you to eat from this tree, but you can eat from any other tree in the garden. What do we do? Hmm, We say, thanks, that's good advice. I don't think we're going to take that advice. I think I want to do it my way. So in effect, Adam said to God, not your will but my will be done. And he had the ability to do that because God gave him free will and God gave him autonomy, see? And 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 humankind, Adam, acted out of a selfishness to do it in his own way. Now, you recognize the overtones of that because later on the second Adam comes along and reverses that prayer from not my will, but yours be done. And, and so... Adam is acting selfishly. Well, the minute he made that selfish choice, this walking in the cool of the evening got broken. In other words, proximity was broken. And you remember the story in Genesis tells us that that humankind was expelled from the Garden of Eden, and those cool night walks never happened anymore after that. That's what we call estrangement. We became strangers, estranjeros in Spanish. You see, proximity was broken, separation occurred, and we were outside the garden, outside of fellowship. So now the mirror gets moved away from the original, And when you move the mirror away from the original and turn it different directions on its own path of selfishness, it can no longer reflect the image it was created to reflect. So now that image becomes blurred, it becomes warped, it becomes broken, it no longer reflects the image it was created to reflect. And that is the result of sin. And When that happens, the effect of sin or the effect of broken proximity, the effect of being estranged or separated from God is that 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 image is, is, you see, warped, broken, disfigured, and now you don't recognize the image it's it's intended to reflect. So you see, in all of that now, we begin to get an idea of some theological principles. The essence of sin is really selfishness. A lot of people say that it's disobedience, and and I get that. But in all reality, uh, the core essence of sin is selfishness. And remember, the second Adam came along later on in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, demonstrates the selflessness that the second Adam introduced as Christ-likeness. So, so you got to see these things kind of in, in comparison and in contrasting and see the full story that God is, is revealing to us. But initially, the essence of sin is selfishness. I want it my way, not God's way. The result of sin, then, is separation or estrangement. We got kicked out of the garden. And the effect E-F-F-E-C-T, the effect of sin then is brokenness or warpedness. We can no longer reflect the integrated whole
whole image that God put within us. Well then, God, because God is motivated by love, then is is desiring restored proximity with us. And so he begins to initiate pathways for us to come back into proximity, you see. And that took the form of the law, took the form of the prophets. And Hebrews 1 tells us, in these last days, God has spoken to us through his son, Jesus, who later on in John 14, 6, you know, says, is the way, the truth, and the life. And then how does the end of the verse go? No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. You see, there's the proximity being restored. There's coming back into proximity with God the Father. Why? Because in restored proximity, the image that is inherent within every human being begins to come back into focus. It is being restored, the warp the brokenness. Warpness is giving way to clarity. Brokenness is giving way to wholeness. Disintegration is giving way to integration. All of these things, see, are beginning to happen as we come closer and closer to God. Proximity is restored. The image is being restored in the mirror because we're getting closer and closer to the original that we were intended to reflect. And in this journey of coming back into close proximity with God, we are being saved. Now, there is a point, obviously, that we all understand in our tradition and our understanding of Orthodox Christian faith, where we have to make a volitional choice, just like Adam made a choice, not your will, but mine be done. There has to be a volitional choice where we say, I'm going to put my faith in Jesus for my salvation. Now, notice the words I used. I didn't say, I'm going to accept Jesus into my heart as my Lord and Savior. And we understand what that means. But the volitional choice is putting our faith in Jesus as the way back into close proximity with God, whereby we are now restored in the image of how God intended for us to be. That is the forming of a new heaven and a new earth. And in salvation, we are being recreated. So you see, it is a journey. It is a process. It is a wonderful embracing of the story of God bringing us back into proximity with himself. And later on in in two episodes, we're going to be talking about some of the some of the typical words that we traditionally ascribe to the idea of salvation. So don't think that I'm somehow jettisoning or undermining or denying, you know, words like repentance and justification and regenerate. Those are all theological terms that frankly uh, can become very complicated to to most of us when we don't understand theologically how to understand those words, if we can just see this as a passionate God desiring to have fellowship and proximity with God's crowning creation and to get back close to us, when when our relationships with other people are somehow broken and we feel that pain, our greatest desire is not to get them to think in a certain way. It is just to be close to them. And when we are close to them, we are transformed. God just wants us back in close proximity, close relationship. And when we are close to God, we begin to be changed back into the image, the ideal, the vision that he had for us when he first created us. I got to tell you, when you think about salvation as the story of God restoring his own image in us, it becomes a far more dynamic journey of daily living, drawing closer, being formed, being made whole, being increasingly holy as God is holy. What a powerful and compelling invitation that God gives to us in inviting us back into his holy presence. So salvation is more than just getting saved, folks. And I hope that you will never think of salvation the same again. What is salvation? It is being restored in the image of God.
And yes, there are steps along the way, but my goodness, this is an amazing gift that God gives to us. And I pray that you will embrace the fullness of the salvation that God offers you, and you will live that salvation, and you will you will share that story of God's love and and reconciling us back into close relationship with himself. So, Susanna, um, let's talk about this. I mean, uh, you know, fix the things where I'm wrong and challenge the things. What, what do you think? Well, I think you did a really good job of articulating a massive subject. <laughs> and I think for most <laughs> people listening, um, there was just there was so much depth in that and really kind of a systematic representation of salvation. And so I think it'd be helpful for maybe us to go through step by step some of the things that stood out to me and we can kind of break it down um, because it's really important what you're saying. And, you know, the overarching sentiment is that salvation is more than the moment that you pray the prayer. And Mm -hmm. maybe we should just start there because Growing up in church, and I, I know it's, it's you know, if you grow up in church as a child, you're trying to grasp with a child's understanding this really big, beautiful thing, which is the atonement and God's work in the world. But growing up as a child, you hear, I need to ask Jesus into my heart, right? And that kind of stays with us as we grow up and as we're bringing other people to the Lord. I, actually, maybe to start, I'm curious, where do you think that language came from? Because, you know, you read verses in the Bible that kind of reference Jesus being the Lord of your heart, but the actual prayer, like asking Jesus into your heart, where do you think that came from? Yeah, that's a great question. And frankly, I got to I got to admit, I don't know where it all came from. I mean, we've all grown up with that. And I certainly did as well. Uh, At the same time in my own life, it was modeled differently. You know, my parents, my family, uh, it was modeled a little differently. We use that language and, and I wonder if it's just a function of people always trying to uh, reduce things to simple phrases or sound bites or propositions that we can somehow contain and turn into a formula. I mean, maybe that's it. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, regardless, we're obviously not saying that it's bad if you prayed that prayer or right. oh, you know you not. want to avoid that language it's just that sometimes i think the evangelical christian church has really simplified something that is meant to be this really beautiful thing that encompasses your whole life and i think you know there's that verse romans 10 9 through 10 which if you confess with your mouth that jesus is lord yep. you believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved so if right. you confess with your mouth if you believe in your heart and I do think we've what we've done is we've taken that one verse in the Bible and we have turned it into a formula because we want to be yes. absolutely sure that people have that decision moment. And like you said, that decision moment is really important. Um, but I guess one question I want to ask you is, do you think that every person who is saved or has been saved had a moment of salvation? Like, is that necessary in this grand picture of salvation that you're giving? Or could it be a more general, like, come into a life of faith does there yeah, have that's to be a really... this moment of sancti- of um justification yeah Sorry to draw yeah those terms you were talking about earlier but <laughs> no i i think yeah I, and we'll get to those maybe in in a couple of episodes uh, yeah i do think you know and and we can talk about this but i do firmly believe that there has to be a moment of volitional um a volitional choosing, whether by words or whether by a quiet, you know, realization that I'm putting my faith in Jesus for my salvation. And and I take that phrase, actually, and, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but it may, but um, I take that phrase really from the Catholic Church. See, when, when I work with, with Catholic faculty members or Catholic individuals, often— um, you know, you, and and maybe a more um, a more Protestant conservative evangelical who says, "When did you ask Jesus into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior?" And for that Catholic, it's like, I have no idea what you just said. I, I, what do those words mean anyway? Um, 
But in their understanding of salvation, there is a moment when they place their faith in Jesus for their salvation. Now, whether that is a prayer, whether those are words, whether that's sitting down at the kitchen table, whether it's kneeling at the altar at the time of of taking communion, whatever it is, there comes a point where in our lives we have allowed or decided to allow Christ to be our means of being restored to God. So yes, I think it does require a will. It required a willful choice to eat the apple. It requires a willful choice to surrender the apple, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I would definitely agree. I like that you emphasize, though, that it's not necessarily a willful prayer spoken out loud in a court in like in a certain way it's it's a willful choice that could come in a variety of different moments and I remember when I first learned that or really I guess spent time thinking about it it kind of shook me up because I grew up in evangelical Christianity where you pray the prayer and you ask Jesus into your heart and the reality is that there are people who in the middle of a church service you know their heart was strangely warmed and they they had a moment where they just thought okay, I'm going to follow Jesus my whole life. And if I reflect on my own salvation experience, um, the moment that I made the willful decision, I was really young. I was like three or four years old, but I remember not praying a prayer at all. I remember being in a worship service while my dad was up on stage as a pastor. And literally all I said was, yes, I remember saying it out loud because in my head, I was deciding whether I wanted to follow Jesus. And I just said, yes, that was all I did. So I agree with you. There's this willful decision that you make, but that's not everything. That's just the beginning of a life of salvation. And that's what you spend most of the time talking about. Yeah. So let me ask you this question, Susanna, because as you look at life and as you look at the world through your lens, um, clearly a younger, um, um, and forgive (laughs) me for saying, I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah, clearly, (laughs) I mean, you tell by the color of my hair, um, uh, younger and a female perspective. I mean, um, when you think about, uh, salvation, I mean, I realize there's a diversity of how you, how people approach salvation. Some people think more propositionally and some people say, if I do a, B and C, then D will result. Um, and other people say it's got to be, I, I got to feel wooed into the relationship. I mean, I guess I would, I would love your thoughts on how, how do you resonate with this idea of salvation merely being proximity with God and the result is that we are changed? I mean, is that, is that offensive or is it appealing? Does it, do you, do, do, do you prefer a propositional understanding? I mean, I'd love your thoughts on that. Well, <laughs> that's a, a really good question. Thinking, I mean, thinking, thinking. I can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. My brain is moving <laughs> a million miles an hour because the reality is that there's truth in what you said in that salvation and, and God's relationship with the world is that he, he came after us. He wants to be in proximity yes. with us. I mean, that's why he sent Jesus. So to say that, that salvation from like a high level statement is the the image of God being restored in us. I think that there's so much theological truth in that. And regardless of um, where you fall on like free will, you talked a lot about free will and choice, right? But there mm-hmm. are some people who fall more on the side of, um, you know, total depravity and, and you don't really do anything to make that choice, right? So there's there's this tension in that. I think regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, the statement that salvation is the image of God being restored in you is still true. And it is mm-hmm. the overarching narrative of salvation that we find in scripture. As far as the the propositional side of things, I just think it's really arrogant for us as human beings to reduce anything that God does to some kind of formula or proposition. God is so much bigger than we can understand. And um, it doesn't mean like, you know, we've talked about in past podcasts, we, we obviously can derive truth, but truth is so much bigger than just like, like truth is a person. Truth is Jesus, right? You've talked about. So yeah. I guess uh, when it, to answer your question more personally, Um, I have a lot of friends who have found Jesus or have been found by Jesus a lot of different ways. 
And I try very hard not to judge the path that they took to get there or um, to even look at their moment of willful decision to follow Jesus um, in a way that, you know, they're, they're very different. I have a, um, I don't know if I, I don't know, I'll just be honest. I have, I have Mormon friends who um, are on their way out of Mormonism, probably eventually, are still very wrestling through the deception that is in Mormonism and, um, you know, the challenges of the Book of Mormon, but they've had these radical encounters with Jesus where they're like, Jesus is my savior. He died for my sin. They've prayed the prayer, you know, they really have. And they're working through the things in their faith that are not true, but Mm -hmm. it's, who is it for me to say that they didn't follow the proposition, right? Like, what does that even mean? Like they are in the process, I would say of being saved if not already and then yeah so that's exposing my own like you know processing no no i get it but i don't want to make propositional stuff everything god is the one who's doing the saving so yeah so what do you say to someone who comes up to you and says hey susanna when did you get saved (laughs) well usually what i say (laughs) but i'm going to give you what i usually say and then what i think you want to hear and what i think everybody should start to think about is that you know i got saved when i was three in my parents church but the reality is, is that that was the moment that I made a willful decision. But, you know, there's that verse, like, through whom we are. Well, I actually. Anyway, there's the phrase, like, we're being saved. We yes. were saved yes. and we will be saved. Right. And yes. so I recognize that I am in the process of being saved right now. And I does that make sense? So, Absolutely. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and what you're saying is that in in the human effort to reduce things to bite-sized pieces, we take a big idea and we bring it down to a singular point. And the 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 the, the good thing about that is that it helps people to be able to pinpoint a central point in this idea of salvation that we often refer to as justification. We'll talk about that later. But we also, the problem with that is that we conflate salvation as one judicial moment and we miss the fullness of salvation, right? Right. We reduce it to a simplistic transactional contract and we miss the fullness of it. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking people, when did you get saved? It's just, you know, we got to understand that it's bigger than that. Right. Yeah. Like no one should hear this and think like we're knocking on that that moment. Cause that can be really beautiful and, and important. And I know um, sure. I've heard it talked about like repentance, right? Like that moment of literally turning around, like doing it, doing a switch and walking in the opposite direction now toward Jesus. Like that's a really important moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, but what mm-hmm. the reason why we're talking about this is because w- when Christians can catch the vision for what yes. God wants to do in and through our lives, it transforms everything everything. And people talk about this a lot now, so it may not be a new idea for some of you. It may be for some others, but salvation and and coming to Jesus is not just so that we can go to heaven. Like it's not like we don't just pray the prayer so that we can get into heaven and avoid hell. Like you said at the beginning, that is a, so such a sad reduction of what Christianity is all about. It actually makes me sad because Jesus isn't inviting us into an afterlife that is free from fire. You know, he's inviting us into a life that is full. It's life abundant. And if we can really catch that vision, then we get to participate with the Holy Spirit in his redemptive work in the world. We get to see the world look more like heaven. But unless we have that understanding of salvation being both the Holy Spirit continuing to work in our lives and then working in the world around us, I think we we reduce the gospel to a you know fear-mongering tactic. Okay, so now is the time for the altar call after that <laughs> that exhortation. I mean, that's that's great. You're absolutely right. And I just think that's a wonderful place to wind this up. And, you know, next time we talk, you know, I, I would like to spend some time talking a little about what that means in terms of our reaching other people um, and offering that beautiful proximity to other people. Um, so... Shall we wrap this up now, Susanna? Do you think, uh, and and we'll turn to the next one? Is that okay? I think we should. And just the the key takeaway points, in case you got lost, salvation is the restoration of the image of God in us. 
sin, the essence of sin is selfishness. The result is estrangement. The effect is brokenness. And salvation is that image being restored in us so that we can come back into proximity with God. I think that summarizes it. Amen. So take that, chew on it, and we'll see you next time. Let me encourage you that who you are is more important than what you do. The lure of defining yourself by your performance is stronger than you might think. So join me in upcoming weeks as we explore the whole leader God created you to be.